All right, I see a couple more people have joined. I'm Meredith Cimeno. I'm the Executive Director of the Early Care and Learning Council. If you wanted to take a moment and pop in the chat, when was the first time like you felt you belong? I had said my girls softball team, the CA Owls. I was the big center fielder when I was five, which meant that I made eyeball shadows with my arms and picked a lot of dandelions, but um, that's what I remember. But it was a great feeling. All right. Join the choir in elementary school, says the musician, Alyssa. Yes, absolutely. I did not feel like I uh, belonged in the um, elementary school choir. That was not my uh, my forte, but that's fantastic. All right, it's 12.04. I think we should get started. People will join and um, I, we'll, we'll get going. So I wanted to take a moment and welcome you all to the August Learning Cafe of the Early Care and Learning Council. I'm Meredith Chimeno. I'm the executive director here Danny Glover and Elijah, if you join us uh, quite frequently, are both not in the office today. So it is me. Um, and I'd like to begin, as we always do, with a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge the indigenous land and the culture of New York. We honor the land as the creator intended and that we commit to keep it clean and support efforts to make it safe for all. We can show honor to the native keepers of the land by recognizing the value of their culture, by learning the truth of their history and how it shaped this great country. Today, we are so fortunate to have Wimoto Nyoka here with us today, Classrooms for the Future, Music and Belonging. We will take a deep dive on what makes us feel like we belong the importance of reciprocity, and how music can be leveraged inside and outside of the classroom. Ms. Nyoka will identify changes in creating spaces of belonging and explore best practices for navigating multicultural environments as an arts educator and programmer. There will be Q&A throughout. We will cover that in a moment, but I hope that you um, enjoy this engaging conversation. Rimoto is an award-winning speculative fiction writer. She is the founder of Dusky Projects, creating and producing horror and sci-fi projects for young adults and adult audiences. I love that. As an educator, she collaborates with a variety of organizations to build multicultural learning environments. Through the use of speculative fiction and creative disciplines such as music, film, and performance, Ms. Nyoko designs and implements family-friendly curriculum and programming to address literacy, creative problem solving, and the importance of youth advocacy. She is a published author and a regular contributor to the Last Girls Club. She holds a BFA in music theater from the University of the Arts and an MFA in performance and interactive media arts from Brooklyn College. Please welcome Wimoto, we are so happy to have you back, to learn from you, to hear from you. Welcome. Just needed to unmute for a second, guys, and then I am going to go back to sharing my screen. Hello, everyone. So great to see you. So our opening prompt was, when was the first time you felt like you belonged? Uh, and I saw a lot of dance listed, sports, some when I got my teachers, when I ran track, when I would teach a certificate. So in the classroom or through through music, I love somebody said when I joined choir, uh, which is kind of what we're talking about today. I'm going to open up as well with answering these questions, because whenever I ask anybody to do anything, I always make sure that I do it as well. Uh, I never ask anybody to do something that I'm not willing to do. So the first time that I felt like I belonged was when I was asked to be a backup singer in my aunt's band. So that's me, if you can see my cursor. Hold on a second. Ooh. <laughs> At the age of like uh, 14, I think, 14, 15 is what I, how old I am there. And then the lovely woman standing next to me is my aunt Manuela. 
Uh, this is her band. They played salsa music. So everything from salsa, merengue, cumbia, boleros, all this style of Latin American music. And, I, you know, this was sort of my first like real job as a teenager. So I was a, an underage performer at clubs um, with a band. Uh, the rules were that I had to stay by the stage or um, on the stage sometimes, or I could be on the dance floor. I could be anywhere near the bar, of course. Um, a lot of the musicians that I that were in the band had also come from similar backgrounds. They've been playing music since they were children and had also been like minors in like in clubs and whatnot. And they said I was super lucky to be able to stay in the club that they used to have to wait in the parking lot in between sets uh, <laughs> and then come in and perform. So I was actually quite lucky just to be able to sit inside. Um, in this experience, you know, I was working with my family. So I had a lot of music, I have a lot of musicians in my family and they would often come and rehearse in our living room. So music and music rehearsal and their creative process was very much a part of just home life. Uh, so being able to graduate to, to participating in, in a very active way felt like I, like it kind of uh, felt very community driven, felt very like this is the next step as I progress into like, being a little kid who's just on the side watching people rehearse um, and actually like being a performer and being a part of it and having to, to do a job and show up and get paid and all the things. So there was that aspect. Uh, it also exposed me to a Latin diaspora. So a larger worldview and a larger understanding of culture and history and what I was a part of, am a part of. Um, through musical traditions, we performed with a lot of really high level uh, salsa and Latin jazz players. Uh, so I got to meet some famous people. Um, and that just kind of opened up like understanding that there's the world is bigger than the little town that I was growing up in, which was Portland, Oregon, which is a very um, useful, I took it for granted at the time, but it's a very profound thing to have as a, as a teenager. You know, teenagers are very self-involved as we know, we were all there. <laughs> and of course, you think your whole world is like the school cafeteria and being a part of this, you know, helped me understand that the world is actually quite big and full of lots of different people and lots of different ways of being through the music. And then lastly, it's very intergenerational. Like I said, I was with my family. I was with other folks from who've been playing at different for different lengths of time who started in eras that I was not born in yet and got to learn about history. So passing the passing and the back and forth of information of knowledge in that way and being comfortable around different different ages um, definitely had a profound effect on me and really made me solidify that I am a part of something, a smaller part of a greater whole. So that was all well and good, but that was all very separate from my school life. Um, I went to performing arts high school, but this part a lot of my friends didn't even know that I did this and they didn't know anything about how it made me feel or what it was like. They'd never seen me sing. Uh, so it was interesting. For some reason, I felt that I had to keep this separate from school and educational spaces. Eventually when I went to college, there was none of this in there. Um, and even when I started teaching, no mention of this, no use of any of the knowledge. Like, it was, I compartmentalized. Um, I'm on you. Technical difficulties, guys. Here we go. Yes. That continued on. After I graduated from college, I joined community education. So this is the second place, the second time I felt like I truly belonged. Um, and I'm just going to hit this little guy here. Community Education was a funk soul hip hop collective in Philadelphia. It started out in jam sessions, which were called ciphers, where musicians would just come together. They would bring their beats, they would bring instruments, and we would just freestyle. Uh, they would play things to see, like, how does this piece work? Does it respond to anybody? Essentially, almost like a calling card to look for collaborators to, for to make further music and perform places. I ended up being recruited in a sense into these weekly jam sessions because everybody could rap and nobody could sing. So <laughs> I would show up and I would just like make up choruses and make up lyrics and just make up things to sing. And that eventually led to me being a part of a collective that took me 
internationally. And I ended up spending some time abroad, a couple of years in Germany and a couple of years in Budapest, um, Hungary. So it both challenged me musically because I had to come up with the music. I learned how to, I really practiced my muscle on composing vocal uh, arrangements, writing lyrics, you know, all of that is, was just a requirement really. Um, it had me working internationally and through this music, I worked with people from many, many, many diasporas all over the world that were connected through how hip hop made them feel. Um, and because of that, it gave me a lot of artistic agency and autonomy. Uh, when you're a musician and when you're booking gigs, you, the financials and the streamlining of that and the organization of that is up to you. <laughs> so I learned how to produce. I learned how to make a schedule. I learned how to make a budget. I learned how to ask for money. Like, what is our rate? I learned how to do these things through being a part of this collective. Once again, though, separate. I'm living this other life. And then over here, I'm teaching and doing some arts programming. And these two worlds have not really met yet. Things really change when I stopped doing that. And I began to bring in this knowledge and this experience and even these people into my classroom work. So here's a picture of me um, doing Fresh Ed, which was using hip hop music and music production and lyric writing specifically to improve ELA skills to help with literacy. Uh, this is Miss Drake's classroom, seventh grade. We are recording our argumentative essays. So they wrote them in the, fir in the form of lyrics of, you know, and we followed the same rules of an argumentative essay, like here's your thesis and <laughs> This is your rule, this is your information to back it all up, but through through rapping and through, you know, essentially like a battle rap, like my side's better than your side. Um, as you can see, the entire classroom is involved. We have a student holding the mic, we have a student recording it. So I wasn't really necessarily pushing like I'm gonna be in charge of all the tech. They got their hands on the tech. There's a student over there with the laptop. I think we're recording all of that into there. She's monitoring the garage band, like. Everyone came together to do this and it was very effective and it changed people's feelings about ELA and about their ability to even do, to do what was being asked of them. But it, you know, it also changed me in that moment of bringing myself, my whole self into a classroom and inviting others to do the same. I didn't realize that that was what was gonna happen but ultimately, once I did it, all the students did it too. Um, so I wanna to touch on a little bit precisely best practices from getting from point A to point B. Um, and that would be transforming the space. You walk into a classroom, people kind of have feelings already, especially once you get to middle school. And I don't know, I know people are teaching different grades at this point. Um, but whether it's the beginning or the middle or they're in high school and it's towards the end, thinking about your space as a class, you know, as a teacher um, and as someone who's maybe running, running an educational program, thinking about the space, how many different ways, how many different things that it can, it can be. The last picture, you know, we're all at the table and we're just kind of, it's like a field recording as that was that that picture was. Here, I actually set up a little recording station, as you can see those two up there at the top that was where you went to go record your verse, right? So we, here's our recording booth. Um, sometimes I would do, I would model open mic nights and be like, okay, so here's the stage. And I would show videos of an open mic and be like, now this is the club and we're in the open mic. So thinking about all the different ways that you can like move chairs around, transform the, stage, the space and then reset it back and like voila, magically it's a classroom again. Investing in youth culture. Um, I, in fact, had to listen to the things that they were listening to. <laughs> Whether I liked it or not, uh, it wasn't really so much about taste as much as what are you into? Why do you like this? Who is this? And how can I combine what I know with what you know? Or, you know, you really like this artist. What is it that I can pull from there and then use it in this, have you look at it in this new way? So this picture here 
of this lyric, those are the lyrics from Hotline Bling by Drake, um, which was, this was a while ago, like 2016, 2015. When he went, that song came out, everybody loved it. And I printed out the lyrics and I said, you know, you have to cut these lyrics up, collage them and make a new lyric. And it has to be unrecognizable. I can't, no one can tell that it used to be Hotline Bling. So it was a remix and that this, I liked this one so much because I thought the student really gave Drake for a run for his money. Since I left, you make me feel that love. It's like a poem. It's like, so great. I was like, man, that's better than his song. <laughs> so investing in youth culture, giving them the materials that they're familiar with and then adding something on that maybe they're not. Oh, and then lastly, lyrics literacy agency. I mean, we're talking about music and that music writing and music just in the space, in the classroom, does in fact have that potential to help you leverage for literacy, to help give students agency, like I wrote this, this is my point of view, um, and to make strong essays at the times was what we were trying to do, um, but essentially just be able to better articulate themselves. So that was in the classroom. People really enjoyed that. And then that extended outside of the classroom, began to spill over, right? Music is contagious. And using those best practices apply to everyone, which is not a thing that I saw coming. I was like, oh, actually this works on adults too. So I just wanted to show a little bit of when we started to connect these same dots outside of the classroom. This is a regular family workshop that was happening at MS 364 in East New York. We were about to see the assistant principal rap <laughs> to a guided exercise by the teaching artist um, JR right there in the corner with a with a mic. Uh, and this was really great. It was after school usually. It was all, you know, like parents and different folks would come in for the family workshop. It was whoever it was really open actually to the community, not just the folks that went to the school. Um, but it was also a way for if you did go to the school, you would see your school administrators in a very different light. Yeah. 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 She had never rapped before, you guys. I just want to applaud <laughs> Ms. Hall's courage of getting up and doing that. Um, and that continued on. So here we're gonna, I'd like to show when we moved into the school assembly place. Now school assemblies can be, as many of you I'm sure know, very um, difficult spaces, especially if you are required to have this assembly and don't know what you're gonna do and you have a limited amount of resources to even bring in a special guest. So it's like, what's gonna happen for this whole period that we have this entire class sitting here in the auditorium? Uh, at, with the schools that I was partnering with at the time when I was the director of this program, I would match those themes up with musicians. So every school assembly was a musical concert where we would address whatever the theme was at the time uh, that needed to be addressed. So again, using music as a, as a binding, as a connector and making school assemblies fun and <laughs> So really more about like school spirit than than anything else than another class you have to go to I guess um excuse me so this is Steph Reed performing the love project uh that's this is this artist's ethos in a way like all his music is about love and this particular album was a deep dive into into love and this assembly was for anti-bullying um, so I just wanted to show the clip of us doing this here
I've never seen a group of seventh graders respond so strongly to a tambourine. <laughs> that really, I love that clip so much because everybody lost their minds when he brought up the tambourine. Um, music is the shortest distance between two points. And once I began to bring in this knowledge that I had, it really became the baseline for to build many other things. I much of this wasn't planned. I didn't know that I could then do school assemblies. I didn't know that I could then do family work. I didn't know that it would bring us all together in this way and that it would affect classroom management. It would affect school environment, school spirit, um, even just the interpersonal dynamics between myself and the staff, the staff and each other, the staff and the kids. Uh, that really became a way for us to to tackle things that are a little bit stickier and a little bit harder. You know, there's a lot of external forces at play when you're working in a school system, whether you're a student, whether you're in the lunch, you know, in the lunchroom, whether you're a teacher, whether you're an assistant principal, principal, whether you're working in the office, you know, it's all, it's all hard work. And we all need ways to come together and smile and feel joy. And that is essentially what music allowed for is a space for joy. I love this quote here by Bessel van der Kolk, if you're familiar with him, The Body Keeps the Score. Um, I highly recommend that book about what music does for people and uh, what it allows them to be able to, to overcome. And I think some of you, you know, were touching on that at the top when you talked about when you belonged and it was joining a choir um, or, or dance, you know, these two things, these arts bring people together. All right, so what happens though when you don't look like your students, right? <laughs> you don't have a cultural shorthand with them. You like music that maybe they don't really like. <laughs> uh, then what do you do? Which a lot of people will will find themselves in. Um, I, you know, I've definitely been in that place. Uh, I wanna talk a bit about best practices that I learned when I was teaching both internationally and also in neighborhoods that have just had folks coming in from countries where I'm like, I don't, I don't speak your language. I've never been there. I don't know where that is on the map. Oh my God, uh, what do I do? Um, so be curious. A lot of the times I would just be asking, <laughs> where are you from? What is this like? And Googling, uh, tell me tell me stories, you know, just be very excited about, about where they are, who they are and where they come from. Identify what is important and let the rest go. This is very hard because again, you have uh, grant deliverables, you have benchmarks, you have a timeline, you have a schedule, you have a test you have to prepare them for. Uh, but still, even, even within that, there are things that can fall by the wayside. Don't tell anybody I told you that, but yes, they can. And you really wanna focus on, this is what needs to happen today and everything else, it's fine. Incorporate, amalgamate. I like to incorporate, again, this is where investing in youth culture comes in. Incorporate what they're doing, some of the things, some of the trends that are happening. You might be able to iterate on these and use them in your classroom. And then it makes it so much easier because they know the game. Ask your students. Uh, kids like it when they get to be experts and they are experts on many things um, that you will not know or be able to retain. So put them to work. <laughs> Ask them, uh, have them lead something uh, or give them credit when they were the ones who came up with the thing. Um, I find that that always helps build rapport and helps me later on down the line. Especially if, again, we have a, either a language barrier or, or some other barrier. Here is me putting all of that to the test. This is when I was working in Germany. I taught a musical theater singing class um, in Dusseldorf. This is the group that came in. They ended up being my little glee club for quite some time. Um, they like Broadway twos, uh, tunes. They, you know, I asked like, hey, what do you want to sing? And they told me. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to combine my music theater training with um, what I know about building community through music. And then you guys are going to bring yourselves to this. And I think it was a student's idea to really to start recording it. And they brought in their recording equipment and it really ends up taking off. We ended up making tracks. So they're singing Rent and they're singing their little hearts out, guys. <laughs> and that's what's happening in this clip. Um, so moving forward, uh, inclusive programming. 
So some of you are probably not in the classroom and are maybe more in an administrative capacity and you're thinking, well, how can I use these in that, in that place? Um, one, I worked with a, with a dramaturg at one point and they said there's no such thing as a general audience, which I thought was a really oh, provocative and have never forgotten it since the, the dramaturg told me that. So uh, this is a picture of the time when I was working as the education and engagement manager at Little Island, which is a park uh, off the coast of Chelsea, Manhattan. If any of you live in New York City and have been over all the way on the West Side Highway, it's Pier 55. It looks like a leaf on the water. And we, I created a mobile library with different mobile libraries that were programmed for each month. So here's one where Women in Comics was in charge of the mobile library. And they also held like family reading because I was in charge of all the family programming. So they would have reading sessions and they would have comic books for young audiences. Um, uh, primarily is what I think I, I asked them for. Um, and they were all made, you know, they're women in comics. So it's all comics written by women. And that was one month free, the Free Black Women's Library was programmed, Teatro Sea, which is a wonderful bilingual theater and the Lower East Side was also programmed. They have bilingual books, they brought in their puppets, uh, they had reading sessions. So it was really, I just kind of set up a container and then reached out to partners. I do feel very strongly about when you are a programmer, identify the people that are experts, you're not gonna know. There's no possible way you can know everything and let them just give them what they need to shine. And you make friends and you, you cover a wide range of communities. And especially with a, something like Little Island, you know, it's a public park and it has to be a place where everyone feels welcome, which is no easy task. So really making as many friends as possible and, and setting something up for many entry points, I think saved my life. <laughs> Um, I would also like to say that we partner with The Door. Uh, that's another great organization. Services mostly young people wrap around services, so legal, medical, as well as artistic. We um, set them up every Friday. They would have a they would have an open mic for teens, and then um, little kiki ball. So that's still going on every Friday, I believe. Little Island is still open with programming, so you can go check out their open mic. <laughs> uh, we also did a Comic-Con, and this was something, again, I reached out to the experts. They have a youth council. I said, hey, I could bring in some folks that could organize a Comic-Con for you. Is that something that you would even like? And they said yes, and then they, these youth leaders told me here's what we need. We need these workshops leading up to it about building portfolio because some of us want to work in comic book industry or want to do something in visual arts. We need this. And we set that up together. So again, it wasn't me really coming in and saying like, hey, I have this. It's already set. Do you want it? Which is one approach. It was like, I have this idea. Are you interested? What would you need? And how can we meet halfway? And then that really ensured the excess of of this Comic-Con that happened. And lastly, I wanna to touch on accessibility because I know that for a lot of people who are more on the arts admin side, this is a word that comes up a lot. <laughs> people are use that word, they toss it around willy-nilly and they expect you probably to address that and to have everything that you're doing somehow be solving the accessibility issue with sometimes very little support or funding or guidance on what that means. Um, I recently wrapped a contract with the Wilma Theater in Philadelphia that was all about accessibility programming, supportable studios. In fact, the sole purpose was that, was bringing that to the theater. Um, we had senior theater classes in which seniors would make up their own the, the whole course of the residency was them devising their own theater piece, that, their own theater piece that they would then perform. We had writing and poetry classes at a um, shelter that was for the housing vulnerable and for people in transition. And we would discuss themes based on what was happening in the season. They would come see shows and they were also 
then given prompts and, and writing exercises, which resulted in a zine that was distributed to them and Elva Theater. And we also had English circles. So people we would use what was happening in the theater, come, you know, organizing field trips for them to come see the shows, and then talking about them and having like theater games and creative ways of talking about this particular subject as a means of language acquisition. And that was a virtual program in partnership with the library. Uh, and that was also very successful for people who are just like coming in. They can't necessarily go to a class. Uh, they can't afford it. Um, or just even going to an English class is really intimidating. It's really scary. This is a very low stress way of practicing English conversation and building up your confidence in that. This picture here is the open mic. So there was also some programming at the theater um, and most of the open mics were, the attendants were folks that were in the portable studios. So seniors that were taking the class, people in the English um, circles and folks from the, from the organization that dealt with um, transitional housing. They were invited, they knew they were invited, they would come here. They had pieces already they were working on in the class and they would read them. Uh, the person standing at the top was a featured guest. So there, a lot of the open mics had a featured guest. So they would also get to see new new people. Um, and this was, you know, it's a pretty successful way of addressing accessibility. Um, I wanna move into like, what was challenging though? <laughs> so these are what I learned just through this little time of doing accessibility, because it wasn't always easy. It was never easy, actually. Uh, which was that, you know, identify what kind of accessibility you want to really focus on. Um, I think it really, really, it goes into these three buckets of economic, cultural, or disability. And I do feel like you need to focus on one. Um, I know a lot of times when you're in that position, and you might ask, like, what kind of accessibility and your client and or your, you know, your supervisor will be like all kinds. It's really hard. Uh, we had live audio description as part of the accessibility programming and simply doing that, of uh, finding audio describers, training new audio describers, because there's there wasn't many and there was a real lack of diversity within them. And that affected, that did not match up the diversity of the actual theater that was being produced. So we had to like say, okay, well, we need to, our audio describers also need to kind of match the work that we're making. Um, doing that, scheduling rehearsals, going through like just having time to listen to the AD work, give notes, make sure that you're providing quality live audio description. We had to partner with, we had a low, um, a disability organization that we partnered with, which gave us a leader in a, like a low vision person who was willing to come and, and basically beta test a lot of our programming and say like, this is what was good and this, y'all need to work on that. Um, and even just in doing that of just like learning how to like appropriately guide someone from the box office down to their seat uh, was, I was like, wow, this is, this is a, a job, just this. Uh, inevitably, Portable Studios, or not maybe inevitably, unfortunately, Portable Studios did end. Uh, the theater was not able to sustain it. And the, the Live 80 work then got funded and is now uh, under another organization. And the theaters, this theater, along with many other, are partnering. They are training sites. So that was how they had to shift it. I, I say all of that just to... to highlight how much work and time and energy really had to go into that, that it needed to be it's a separate program with theaters partnering to adequately do this, to bring in that audience, to welcome them and to be able to service them. Um, so be transparent about the resources and the capacity that you really have to, to you know, for whatever accessibility it is that you want to focus on. And remember that intersectionality is real. So even if you're like, we're only doing economic, chances are you're going to hit cultural and disability. We're only doing disability, chances are you're going to hit these other ones. You can go deep and not wide, and it's cool. Like, we had many different kinds of audio describers coming in, which supported the work that we were making, and the audiences responded well to that. So I ended up hitting cultural when, in fact, I was focusing on simply, like, how do I get a good live 
audio description going for these shows. Um, so I just wanted to take a beat to say that because I see that word being thrown around a lot. And I think like some clarity on, on what you mean by accessibility and what you can really do. I just want to encourage people and empower people to, to do that and say, you know, it is okay if you can't hit all of them. Do one. That's a lot. And lastly, I want to talk about this word safe. We talk often as teachers and as arts programmers or programs administrators about creating safe spaces. And it is very difficult to promise that this world is unsafe. I don't know if I can keep you safe. That is that is the truth. So I have shifted away from, from that word and instead of focusing on the word reciprocity and creating a space of reciprocity, creating and holding space for whoever it is that I'm collaborating with and working with to feel as though they can be truly heard and seen and that we would create this dynamic with one another. This is the relationship that we're gonna have. One that is based in us really seeing and really hearing one another and holding each other in our minds and in our hearts. You hold me in your mind and heart and I do the same. And this I can commit to. This I can open up a conversation with and say, this is what I'm about. Are you about that? It's fine if you're not and it's transactional, but then we know. But that reciprocity is the goal. I feel that shifting into that, into that mindset, then, then we can handle anything because we're in it together. So now I'd like to open it up and I see there's some people in the chat um, and I'm gonna look at what you guys have been typing. I haven't been able to do it. This part you can type in the chat as well, or you can raise your hand and voice. What is it you, you know, but this is the Q and A part uh, and discussion. So just reflecting back on that first question, the first time you felt like you belonged, what was it about the space that made you feel that way? Can you think like specifically what it was that made you feel like you belonged? So type or raise your hand and talk. I was just going to share my experience, which was familiarity with the place and space that I was in and the people that I was with allowed for me to feel like I belonged. And for those of you that didn't join, it was on my five-year-old softball team, um, but I was just comfortable and it felt wonderful. Um, but we have someone, so it's J-I-S-L, Mariah, that raised their hand. And I'm hoping that you will be able to unmute them. I think she did it. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, my name is Giselle. And for me, um, it was running track. Um, I'm from Trinidad. So at the age of five, I started running. And then when I was seven, I was one of the youngsters that was selected. So I used to represent Trinidad and Tobago you know, throughout the Caribbean. Uh, for me, I felt really accepted there because you know, um, a lot of people look up to me, even though I was seven and oh. I was able to motivate other people, you know, share my experiences, what it feels like to go to a neighboring Caribbean island and represent the country, you know, in sports. And I I love sports at the time. I did many different things, but track was like my number one love. So I felt really, really at that point, really accepted. So Hmm. You know, what really stood out for me about what you said was that you were a leader, you and that people respected you. And I it it made me think about, you know, when I was saying ask your students, they're experts, like that that is really what that is about. Uh, uh you know, having folks step into leadership, being encouraged to do so. And again, that space of reciprocity, people cared about what you thought. And they wanted to hear what you had to say. <laughs> they wanted to see you run track, <laughs> and they were, you know, they were rooting for you, and that that made you feel accepted. So, just touching on that, that really, that really moved me. And I'm also thinking about the times when maybe I felt that way too, um, and that it was, yeah, that opportunity to just again be seen and be heard and be taken seriously. Um, 
Yeah, representing your country. I mean, like at seven, that's pretty impressive. I see here also someone wrote Caribbean dance class. There's There was no mistakes, no judgment, just music and joy. Again, joy, that word. And also I wanna touch a bit here on no mistakes, no judgment. Um, that a lot of the times because we are in a, in an environment where we have to, we're teaching a test or a test is coming up or these ideas, this uh, setup where there is a right and wrong answer. And sometimes that's true, but that that sometimes leaks into places where it doesn't really need to be um, and how challenging it can be to, to set up that dynamic in a classroom. Uh, I was, we were given feedback on some of the writings of the students and I kept saying, you know, people are gonna read their work and I want you to just say what stood out for you and what you wanna know more about. And then they would say, well, what I liked was this. And I would have to say, no, 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 not what you like, just what stood out for you and what you wanna know more about. And just trying to break that habit of like, I like this, I don't like this. We like this, we don't like that. This is good and that is bad, you know? It's, it can be a challenging dynamic to break away from, but when it happens, as this person noted, you feel that you can make a mistake, you feel that there will be no judgment, and there was just joy. So again, creating that space of reciprocity. Uh, does anyone else have anything that they wanna, else they wanna share about, about the first time they belong, what was it about the space that made them feel that way? Okay, my next and last question, before I really open it, then we can just like free for all talk. Um, can you replicate that? So thinking on that experience, thinking about when you went and represented your country, um, when you were in this dance class and there was no judgment and no mistakes, just music and joy. Can you replicate that in your classroom or your workplace or even a Zoom meeting? <laughs> Do you feel like you can do that? Uh, does anybody want to pop on and say like, yeah, maybe I could try this? Or can you share even why I feel like it might be hard? You can type or unmute or raise your hand, I guess. I think people are thinking it does make me remote to think about how at work, so I'm not in the classroom and John's going to answer that or respond, but um, there's a balance, right, between making a place feel comfortable. Um, so this is from a professional standpoint, comfortable, um, but then balancing it to the professional as well. And so I always try, try to do both and struggle with it quite often. Um, I, I'm much more comfortable operating in the space of feeling like things are family and familiar. And so sometimes it's hard from a professional um, lens. I think as an educator it with children, uh, it, it's sometimes easier. So it's just me. Hmm. Uh, I see some people saying, you know, I try, but as an adult, things are different. And sometimes there's a fear of being judged. And I saw someone raise their hand. John raised their hand. Yes. Hi. Thank you for... Thank you for bringing reciprocity back to um, my attention. I actually do talk a lot about space and work that I do around restorative practice. <clears throat> I use a quote from Humberto Maturana, who's a biology um, PhD, who said, love is opening space for the existence of another. Yeah. <clears throat> However, even in that open space, it does take that reciprocity. And that's, that's the key to it. And I was thinking, so I have this dream job at Office of Mental Health, and it's only because I brought an idea to our chief child psychiatrist who list, who took the time to listen to me and then bring it to our associate commissioner. And now that is my main job that I brought, mm -hmm. and only because they listened. And it just reminded me of this. I was doing a work day with a whole bunch of people um, last Sunday, and even in the midst of like people working so hard and sweating and taking time. We were ripping out a tree and a, uh, a colleague of mine at Department of Health had this idea, which she called the tree for all, 
about like planting trees that have fruit and on it. So people, you know, who are homeless or walking the streets can just grab food. And it turned out that another person who was right by us was like, oh, I know about that. We actually have that. We do that in Albany. And so my colleague who thought of it, who works for the state, I'm going to like loop back with her and say, hey, there's already stuff going on. I renamed it. Um, it's a tree for all. Um, <laughs> kind of playing on the free for all part. But just the fact that my friend listened to me, even in the midst of something else, it was just so heartening. And it may take off even further because he took the time to do that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I and I kind of want to I want to connect what you said with what Meredith said of just um, professionalism and our 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 feelings around that word uh, and wondering this is really just a question you know listening to John talking about reciprocity and being listened to and something that was a bit more casual still in a workspace um, why is reciprocity unprofessional? is a is a thing really just kind of a rhetorical question um because i also see that people are like as an adult you know sometimes you want to do that but there's a fear of being judged and so i wonder about our shared understanding of professionalism and if that is not serving us if creating a space of belonging feels antithetical to having a professional space uh that it has to be one or the other. And I just want to present that as like, where, how do we get there? And is it possible that creating a space of belonging, creating reciprocity will lead to professionalism? Somebody raise their hand. I saw that someone raised their hand. I yes, know. hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hi, um, thank you. This has been a, a really fascinating workshop. Um, I struggle with that question as well because the the political climate is so weird. <laughs> and I and I teach in New York City and it's still weird yeah. in terms of um, a lot of different things. So I think that um, as long as we're honoring the best of what the children's needs are. Um, I'll be working with some migrant kids. I'm starting in a couple of weeks, actually. And I I don't know much about their cultures. I'm Googling it. I'm asking friends. Um, I'm doing the best that I can. Mm -hmm. But for me as an educator, um, it's about in the service of the kids and what's best for them. Um, so that's that's kind of my feeling on it. But I think it's it, it can be a slippery slope if we get into something other than what's best for the children. Yes, I, I agree that, that it can get into a slippery slope. Uh, and then I, and I just again want to just from my personal experience, when I started to bring my whole self into the classroom and incorporate the things that were in fact good for the adults, it ended up being good for the children. Uh, the adults not really getting along um, or not communicating with each other or not modeling that behavior affects the kids. And when the relationships there improved and became a relationship based on reciprocity, we were able to collaborate and then do more things for the kids. And that affected the way it felt in the classroom, the way it felt in the school. So going back again to some of not not only Bessel van der Kork, but there was another one I mean Adrian Marie Brown talks a lot about this but like taking care of yourself like you can't actually provide care for people if you are not taken care of uh, and I think that that is something that educators that is a pattern that educators fall into very it's a very demanding job so it's very very easy and you are encouraged in fact to just do what's best for the kids and then forget about yourself and that is unsustainable point blank you will not make it. So, you know, we go, we got to be together on this. Um, and again, just going back to, yes, the political climate is challenging, which is why I just feel like stepping up and being, you know, strong back, but soft front. 
Can we have reciprocity? Um, can we do this with one another? Because, because it is good for us and it is good for the children. <laughs> like it's in fact the only way we're gonna be able to do our job. <laughs> uh, you know, just bringing that back and, and holding that, it's, it is hard. This is not easy what I'm talking about. But when you do it, you're hooked. You really can't go back. Like the effects are really enormous. Again, I, I intended for this to only be in the classroom and then ended up being in the whole school. I, I didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, so just, you know, just encourage Just It's not even really like you have to do this, but just considering it, especially as you're going into this, like you said, you're working with mostly Muslim kids, like, yeah, building these bridges and and finding coworkers that maybe you could do that with. And I know it's a capacity issue. So obviously, even if it's just a small thing, you know, being kind, not only, not only to the students, but to yourself. But I hear you, it is very challenging. <laughs> uh, Anybody else want to want to chime in? Meredith, you look like you're about to say something. <laughs> I was, I was, was going to say I'd give it a last call, and then it is one. It's just about one o'clock, so I was going to wrap things up. But we'll give it a second to see. Okay. Yeah. This was incredible conversation. I really appreciate it. It's not what I expected, but it's exactly what I needed today. So thank you so much for it. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. And thank you to everybody who shared, who put themselves out there and were vulnerable and who spoke even about the things that are challenging. And I just want to acknowledge, yeah, it is. And I'm just fostering that like, we're in it together. Like all these people, all of you showed up today and you're all on the same side. <laughs> so like, you know, you're not alone. No. We aren't. Absolutely. It's it's what Fanny Glover always speaks about our village that we're, that we're in it together. So thank you. So friends, I'm so happy that you joined us today. We will record. This has been recorded. We will put it on our YouTube channel. We'll send you a link. You can have Wemoto's contact information in that. I really appreciate everything that you did. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.